All right, welcome to our next video. Uh, this one is gonna be about the methods that are found from the math class and the string class. So what are we gonna be talking about today? We're gonna be talking about the following math methods. So from the math class, we can get methods like max, min, power, random, square root. My students insist on calling that squirt. It makes me uncomfortable, but that's how that works. String has, uh, we've been working with strings already, and that is uh, words, right? Strings of characters together. It turns out the string class also has really useful methods in it. It has index and substring and char at, oh, excuse me, index of, my goodness, index of, substring, char at, are all going to be methods that we look at today. All right, so what is the problem this video is trying to handle? Well, as you are developing bigger Java programs, you're having to write all of your own methods. You're declaring variables, multiple statements, print statements. You might be thinking to yourself, geez, is there any tools that are pre-existing? Um, did, did the makers of Java write any methods that I can use? There's a lot of really common functions I want to do, namely math functions. Can't I um, just use what's already there? And the answer is yes. The first class we're going to talk about today is math, capital M-A-T-H. And the idea is that it is a class provided to us that allows us to perform different math functions. When we were talking about arithmetic in an earlier video, we remarked that it was frustrating that I can't use just the caret to describe... Oh, oops. <laughs> Hold on. See, kids, you have to make sure that your file name and your class name match in order to compile. Okay, so we wanted to try to use 2 to the power of 3. We wanted x to be 8, but unfortunately, the caret does not mean exponents. It means something wildly different. Uh, so instead, if I wanted to represent 2 to the third power, I would say capital math, capital M math, capital math is my superhero name, math dot power of 2 comma 3. Uh, oh, and I should emphasize, uh, if we look at the warning that Java is giving me right here, it says, hey, whenever we do powers, the return type of this particular method is going to be a double. So don't try to assign it to an int because that ain't going to work. So I'll say, you got it, Java. I'll make sure that I store this in a double. So what are we doing here? Well, in the previous video, we talked about parameters and return values. Well, POW stands for power. It's a method that belongs to the math class. So somebody wrote public class math and put this POW method in it. And its job is to take two numbers. I believe it can take ints or doubles. And because it can handle multiple versions, it's an example of overloading, which we're going to see again in a minute. So it produces, uh, it takes in two inputs, a couple of numbers, and then it produces one output, um, which that's something that differentiates parameters and return values. You can always have multiple parameters, one to very many. I certainly wouldn't have more than 10, um, but I'm, I'm sure that you could get something with 100 parameters to compile. Um, but you can only ever return one value. So what we're going to do with that value, math.pow2,3, I'm going to save it in the location x, and then let's go ahead and print this out. Print line x. And we see math and strings. We execute our main method. Ta-da, two to the third power is indeed eight. And we see that even though we provided it ints as inputs, the way that pow works is it converts everything to doubles, and that's what we see right here. All right, so what are all of the methods that are useful? Um, you could go to the online Java Oracle, which um, has a comprehensive list of everything that's in the math class. That's fine, um, but really I'm going to give you the list of the ones I think are probably most important, uh, and your textbook also is going to have ones that are useful. So math dot, uh, another one is going to be max. It returns the larger of the two values. Again, I think it can handle uh, multiple inputs. The larger of the two is going to be 5, and so it returns 5. I could say math dot min. And we write that out. It gives me a minimum of three. Um, it's worth noting, we might think, oh, this also converts things to doubles. Well, look what happens. If I put this directly into the print statement, uh, oop, 
one too many semicolons. There we go. And I run it, uh, it's actually three. The reason it was giving me a double before is because I'd assigned it to a double variable. And Java had implicitly cast that from an int to a double for me so I could save it in a double spot. I think just to make sure that we don't confuse what the return type is going forward, I'm just gonna leave it in the print statement for right now so you can see what type it becomes. So the ones we've covered so far are power for power, minimum, maximum. Uh, min and max only take two numbers at a time. So you might want the minimum of three numbers. Well, you'll have to do a little bit of extra work for that. You could use math.min, uh, but you'd only be able to process two numbers at a time. So it's something to think about. Uh, another popular one is math.random. Math.random doesn't take any parameters. <gasps> well, what does it do? Well, when I go to run it, it gives me ugh, 0 0.92. What? Well, how about run it again? Oh, 0 0.19. All right, so what's math.random doing? This one I'm going to go ahead and spell out. Math.random says give me um, uh, any decimal between 0 and 1, but we say that the 1 is excluded, which means even though it's unlikely, it is technically possible to get 0 0.00000. That is within the range of outcomes for math.random. It is not possible to get one. I can get point nine 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 nine, but that's it. Um, you might be thinking to yourself, "Geez, this doesn't seem very useful." I, you know, if I want to approximate rolling a dice, how would I do that? Well, you could do something like, "All right, six times math dot random," and I roll it now, and okay, five point two or three point four or four point nine. Well, that looks a little better. But you're saying to yourself, yeah, okay, but these are all still kind of gross decimals. This doesn't look like a die roll to me. So what you can do is wrap this guy in parentheses and use an explicit cast, which means we're going to say to Java, hey, uh, double, I really just want you to be an int. Take whatever your decimal is and drop it. That's what this explicit cast does. So we compile it, we execute it, and now we see we can get the numbers 5 and 4, we should be able to get zero. I don't know if I'll be lucky enough to get it to come up. Oh, curse you. Wow, three fives in a foot. Come on, random. There we go, three. Um, so we are almost at something that's equivalent to a die roll. If I said six times math dot random, that gives me everything from zero to 5.9. By casting it to an int, that means I get all the numbers from zero to five. So zero, one, two, three, four, five are all represented, six different numbers. If I then just say plus one, now, the expression you see in front of you approximates a die roll. I can get six, and if I'm very lucky, I can get a one. Of course, because I'm recording, it will not let... Aha! Hey, how about that? That's awesome. Okay. So, uh, that is how to use math.random. I'm going to go ahead and clip this guy out here because it's pretty useful. A six-sided die... Whoops. Die roll. Looks like that. I know, a bit, a bit uh, mumbo jumbo there. All right, the last one I wanted to point out was square root. Uh, I'll say square root of four. Uh, oh, math dot, of course, of course, of course. Can't use the method unless I invoke the class. What's mad now? Oh, and then I need another parentheses. Okay. You always must close as many parentheses or curly brackets as you open. You must do so in the correct spot. All right, so we go to run this. 2.0, and I think it can even handle bizarre rational numbers like the square root of five, I think is, yeah, 2.23 and so on and so forth. All right, so if you wanna perform some advanced math, check out the math class. If you just Google Java math, it's the first link, it's the Oracle link. Um, you can do logarithms, you can use uh, trigonometry functions, inverse trigonometry functions, all kinds of stuff, it's really fun. Um, so that's the math class. Let's contrast the math class with string methods. So there are string methods. Their names are above. We see them index of, substring, so on and so forth. So you might think to yourself, okay, well, if to get to math's methods, I just said math.square root, can I do just string dot index of? And the answer is no. This isn't how the syntax works. Um, and the reason is that we are going to access math methods statically, which means um, from the class. We are gonna access string methods 
locally, which means from the object. So what is the difference between, I don't know why I just capitalized those differently, from the object. So what's the difference between a class and an object? Well, you've probably noticed that all of these pieces of code that we've written so far always start with public class. Uh, well, it's going to come a point in your programming career that you're actually going to have multiple files that you're going to use. There will be um, the main method will be ha housed in one class, but then you'll have another Java file that's a different class. And you're allowed to make objects from that class. The analogy that we always use in class is the cookie and the cookie cutter. The cookie cutter is the class. It's the blueprint. It's going to tell you what the shape of your object is going to be. But the cookie itself is the object, right? So you've got that little star cookie cutter. You stamp it down. You make a star cookie. You bake that off. All of your star cookies can look different, right? They can be frosted differently. They can have sprinkles on them. Um, but at the end of the day, it was the class that gave them their fundamental shape. So I need not just to access the class, but I need to actually make a string object. And that object is what allows me to use these string methods. So let's declare a string. Um, I'm going to call this a string quote. And we'll quote Mr. Jesse Pinkman, yo, 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 because that he's just like one of the greatest characters in television of all time. Go watch Breaking Bad. If you're under 17, get parenting approval, parent approval, I guess. Uh, but all right, so string quote, yo, yo, yo. So what can we do here? Well, I'm going to make another print statement. We'll go ahead and box this guy out right here. All right, so if I just print out quote, that's saying, hey, a uh, variable quote, what are you? And it would say, yo, yo, yo. But if I say quote dot length, and we know it's a method because it has parentheses right there. Well, I run that, check out what it's going to do. It's going to return the number of characters in my string. So we've got yo and a space and yo and a space and yo. That three yo's makes six characters plus my two spaces makes eight. So the length is going to count um, characters, both uppercase and lowercase. It's going to count spaces. It's going to count punctuation. Every character gets counted for length. All right, well, how about this? What if I said char at 2, uh, 1? Let's go char at 1. I go to run this, and it gives me O. So what is char at doing? Well, it turns out that strings are indexed. I'm just going to say indexed so I don't run out of line. And they're actually zero indexed. What does that mean? It means when you get to the first one, you don't count starting with one. You start count starting with zero. So this first Y has an index, which is another way of saying maybe it's address or it's location. This first Y has an index of zero. This O has an index of one. And we can see, oh, I just asked for the character at location one. That gave me this O. Uh, this space has an index of two, three, four, five, six, seven and so on and so forth. There's an important thing to know, which is the last index is always one less than the length of the string. And the reason for that is we count our letters starting at one, but we index our letters starting at zero. I know that feels like an obnoxious difference, but it's the way it is, and over time you will come to appreciate why we zero index. All right, so if I wanted to get this particular Y right here, I could say char at three, and I would get that y. So that's how indexing works. All right, so the next one I want to talk about is substring. Substring says, hey, I want a part of the string. If I say substring one, it's going to say, oh, yo, yo. Because what substring just said was, hey, find me the character at index one. Give me that character and everything else in that string. So it was able to return this value. So if I wanted to say uh, string um, quote part, like part of quote, half quote, I'm just going to call it quote part. I could store there, uh, we'll just copy it, quote dot substring one. Because what we're doing is we are returning another string that is a part of this string. So if I wanted to, I could just print out quote part right here. I'd get the same result. All right. So what about substring of, and here's the one that always uh, baffles people a little bit. Let's go uh, 1, 7. 
Well, here we see an example of overloading. And remember, the definition of overloading is uh, multiple methods, same name, different parameters. So I had the one parameter version of substring. There's also the two parameter version of substring. So rather than saying, give me from this index to the very end, we say, give me from this index to this index with a very small twist. Now I get O, yo, Y. So you're thinking, okay, that makes sense, but then look carefully. I was able to get the O, which is index one. That's what I asked for, good. Space, yeah, 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 yeah. I got the Y, but whoop, I did not get that last O. And you're looking at this and you're thinking, well, I asked for one to seven, it gave me from one to six. And that's because when we, in Java, when we identify a range, we include the first term exclude the last term. We actually saw this just a moment ago up at random, right? Random gave us from zero to one. We included zero, we excluded one. So uh, same thing happens with substring. If I want from characters from one to seven, it'll give me character one. It'll not give me character seven. Okay, so this is how we can access uh, methods from the math class. We access it straight from uh, the math class, we don't have to make a math object. Whereas with strings, we have to make a string object, like I made string quote, and then from there, I can call various methods. They have different parameters, and they'll return different values. Um, and so we covered index and substring and char at. Um, again, you can consult with your textbook, or if you Google Java string, you can see the comprehensive list. String actually has a pile of, um, a pile of methods, and they're all really useful. Okay, thanks for watching.